it's an honor to be here. As a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, this is personal to me. I feel it is a responsibility of mine to continue these conversations as the firsthand accounts of those who survived the Holocaust is unfortunately dwindling. And some brief background on me that would be very remiss of me not to pass on. My grandmother, Genya Dichterman Drasnin, my father's mother, is just three days shy of turning 100 on March 19th. She is a survivor of Auschwitz, and for the last 40 years, she has lived in South Florida, in Hallandale here, and in the last six months, she has been under the care of my aunt in New Jersey. My grandfather on my mother's side, Kurt Rosenberg, like we'll soon learn about Dr. Frank's family, escaped Nazi Germany as the war was breaking out. He often characterized his life as a miracle, and I know my family and I live by his words every day. He passed away just two years ago at 99 years old, just a week shy of his 100th birthday. And my grandfather on my father's side, he fought in the Jewish, Jewish Brigade of the Russian Army where the Bielski brothers fought, and he too escaped before the war as well as my mother's mother. So prior to being here tonight and working in the industry, I had the privilege of producing interviews of Dr. Julio Frank on CNN Newsroom in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm glad we are all here and safe and healthy and happy. So thank you very much and it's an honor to be here. So please let me welcome you both, Dr. Julio Frank and Dr. Felicia Nall. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for having us. So over the years, there has been much written about the second generation of Holocaust survivors. These are the children of Holocaust survivors. Today, there are around 60,000 survivors of the 6 million that perished during the Holocaust. And Dr. Felicia Nall, if it's all right, I'd like to start with you as, you know, your father was a Holocaust survivor himself, Sigmund Nall. He spent five years in concentration camps um, and lost almost his entire family in the Holocaust. So can you please share for us what that experience was like for him during the war? Of course, and please call me Felicia. Um, you know, the, the fact that there's 60,000 of 6 million um, encourages me to say that I can't speak for him. Um, I can speak only as the child who watched him struggle um, through survivorship in a way that um, made me realize, as he put in some of his own work, um, that he probably only survived partly. He would probably have said that uh, he lived through, he survived it in bodily form, but that many parts of him died, not only his family, um, in those five years in the camps. And they never, they never quite came back to life in the way um, he would have, I'm sure, hoped they would have in, in the rest of his life. Um, I know we're going to speak about it later, but um, having watched that only until the time I was 18, there are so many questions um, that I wish I could have asked him had he lived longer, I been a little bit older, old enough to know um, what I needed to know. Um, and we are just blessed that he left some of his writings, that he spoke about it publicly when he could, um, and that we could learn from his struggle and all the pieces of him that were left to us um, after five years in the concentration camps. But when you ask me, I, I, can't, I can't speak for him because, thank God, I didn't live what he lived. We often try to understand and define what it means to be a Holocaust survivor today because, as you said, he survived the war physically, but, you know, Partially, mentally, it was still challenging for him, um, you know, throughout the rest of his life, and you witnessed that. Um, and, and Dr. Julio Frank, you know, prior to World War II, your grandparents fled Nazi Germany to Mexico. Um, can you share your family's story of survival and how they managed to persevere in Mexico? Sure. Um, uh, my, my grandparents, um, Mariana, after whom my beautiful daughter, who's here with us tonight, is named, and, and her husband, uh, Ernst, um, had lived, got married and lived for many years in, in Hamburg, uh, Germany. 
Um, but in the uh, 1930s, the climate of anti-Semitism had grown to unbearable uh, levels. Uh, my, my, my grandparents were both as many professionals uh, and intellectuals in the Weimar Republic, um, highly assimilated Jews, very active in the political life. My grandfather was a very popular physician. Uh, it, it was, uh, it, 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 and, and he was very active in the anti-fascist movement. Uh, the Nazis were not yet in power, but the, the Nazi party was already active and the SAs were roaming around bullying and uh, people, uh, bullying Jews specifically. Um, they had two young children. One of them was my father, who was six years old, and the other was my aunt. Um, at, a, at a certain level, <coughs> the, uh, the, at a certain point, the level of anti-Semitism had grown to the point where they just decided that that was not the environment that they could bring up their young children. And um, by one of those incredible coincidences in life, uh, it happened that my grandmother, who was an incredibly uh, intelligent woman, who loved Romance languages and had self-taught Spanish, French, Portuguese, and a little bit of Italian, met in a bookstore a person who worked in the uh, in the Mexican consulate in in uh, in Hamburg. They became great friends because she was a very friendly person, my grandmother. And after confiding in her the humiliations that they were experiencing, especially my grandfather was particularly targeted as a as a prominent physician, a Jew, and a politically active. Uh, opponent of the Nazi party uh, and, uh, suggested that they migrate to Mexico. Uh, and in doing so, she saved their lives. She saved the life of my father and my aunt, and that made my own life possible because I wouldn't obviously be here most likely had that not happened. Um, so, so that is uh, a, the, the brief account. My grandparents managed to get out early enough that they, upon arrival to Mexico, organized uh, <clears throat> what is to this day called the Israelite Central Committee that unified the Jewish community. And when the uh, full horrors of the Nazi regime and then the war became evident, were highly involved in helping Jews escape, they managed to bring the entire immediate family, my uh, grandmother's three uh, siblings, uh, but, but sadly, uh, my, my grandfather's only brother uh, was one of the many people who thought that this was not going to go anywhere and that it was not necessary to migrate. And he, of course, was murdered in the camps, uh, my, my, my grandfather's one, one brother. So, uh, but in the end, most of the family managed to escape before the worst uh, happened. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what that was uh, that, that that move to Mexico, uh, what it meant for them, and and, uh, and 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 how that shaped everything that followed. Because your father was born in Germany, right. and so he was how old when? He was six years old when they came to Mexico. My my aunt was four, 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 four years old. Um, my grandparents themselves were relatively young; they were in their early thirties, uh, and and uh, and they started a whole new life. They arrived to a country where they looked very different. They spoke very differently. They prayed very differently. And yet that country, uh, a country that was much poorer from any material perspective, uh, but was certainly much richer in terms of what really matters, uh, solidarity with the oppressed, uh, opened its arms and, and, and allowed them to start a new life. The opportunity that Mexico presented itself to your family and, and your family settled in Canada, both in the public health spheres um, and industries and worlds. How old were you both when you learned about your family stories and you know the challenges that they that they experienced? So actually, my my father's story, of course, was was very different. Um, he 
escaped two days before um, the last camp that he was in was liberated with my understanding with a close friend whom he had been with throughout most of those five years. Um, his friend was shot. He managed to escape and uh, spent the better part of a night and a day in a river and then in a tree where he um, was found by a German shepherd, by a dog. Um, and that German shepherd turned out to be not a Nazi German shepherd, but um, a German shepherd that belonged to a, uh, a peasant family that took him in for a few days until he was then um, liberated and, and hospitalized for for some period of time. But um, my father was unable to find anyone or anywhere that was willing to take him in for quite a long period of time. Um, once he was well enough, my understanding is that he was going to school in Munich um, to some combination of medical and dental school, but had a tremendous need um, to, to leave, that there was a tremendous degree of anger. And he was afraid of actually how um, that hanger would come out at some point. And there was a, an article in the New York Times um, in about 1948 that, uh, that we have, actually, of um, one of the, the um, individuals from the U.S. Uh, forces who would help liberate the camps wrote about him trying to get him out. But what I'm getting to is that no one um, would take him, despite him having an uncle in, in New York who was, who was trying to get him out. And the Canadian government... Um, decided, having not taken in many Jews during the war um, at all, the none was too many story, um, did give a scholarship for 20 men and 20 women who had survived Auschwitz. And so he took that scholarship, but he never completed dental or medical school. So he took the scholarship um, in order to leave and uh, studied business, which was what he was offered, um, coming to the University of Toronto without ever having done either uh, my son junior high or high school or anything of that like. Um, so he must have left when he was 13 or 14, having had to leave school and uh, speaking no English and got himself somehow through a degree in, um, in business and accounting at uh, the University of Toronto. But that's how he, he came out. Um, and only because of the luck of, of that sort of offer at that time. And what was it like for you growing up as the child of a Holocaust survivor in Canada? And you were asking, what are some of my first memories? You know, I um, was, I must have been not more than four or five. Um, and my memory is having, you know, crept out of bed as children do, wanting to, um, to speak to their parents and hearing my father reading some of his work and speaking to some of his friends about the Holocaust. And finally, you know, understanding a little bit about um, the tattoo on his arm he was branded, um, which is, I think, probably the correct word for it, branded in Birkenau, um, and beginning to understand what that meant and the, you know, the sort of children's... Um, nightmares of the Nazi witches, the trying to get out of places, trying to save him and being unable to save him from a, a very tiny age. And the realization that because he was, when in 15 came out at 20, um, my parents waited quite a while before they were married and had children, he wasn't sure he could. And so um, I was on the tail end of being the, the G2. Um, the child of a survivor. So my class, although in Hebrew day school, I don't remember any other children of survivors. And what I do remember is that all the other families had grandparents and aunts and uncles. And my mother's parents had died young, had not, they did not go through the camps, but we had no one, we were just the four of us. And that, plus the stories I had heard and that branding on his arm um, were the memories that I, the first memories I had of trying to understand. And I should note, you have a brother as well. Um, you know, you reflect on the stories that your, your father shared with you. He was a poet, and he expressed a lot of his emotions through his poetry. I'm going to have you read some a little later on, but do you remember him reading poems to you uh, about the war during that time? You know, that, it's interesting. I don't remember him reading. I remember my mother editing. You know, his, his uh, first language was Polish, and then he spoke German, Yiddish, and several others. But he never wrote in any language other than English, um, which my mother would 
dutifully edit on a regular basis as he wrote short stories as well as poetry. Um, no, I remember him speaking and I remember me interviewing him um, because at a Jewish day school, this was you know, something that we were sometimes asked to do and occasionally him giving interviews. Um, we would go to Israel, we went several times to Israel and that was where he tried to unravel what had happened to you know, six half brothers um, and the rest of the family in different ways and him speaking um, sometimes there in Polish um, in ways I couldn't understand but understanding that we had made those journeys in order to try to under to to, to gather information um, when Yad Vashem was you know still starting out many of us we still didn't know where our families had ended up, what had happened. Um, and I do remember him going to his own registering at Yad Vashem, all that we knew about the family. Did you have a similar experience when you first learned about your family's past? Um, did they get involved with Yad Vashem at all early on? My, I mean, my father, from my earliest days, <laughs> told the story of why we were in Mexico, why we had a unusual last name for a, for a Mexican, um, why he looked so different from most of the, the people, and, uh, and instilled in us, a first of all, a sense of outrage of what had happened, uh, the, and at the same time, a deep sense of gratitude to the country that had embraced him and his sister and his, and, and his parents. So, the, the, so this story that I just summarized was was uh, part of the daily conversation. As I said before, my grandfather became very actively involved as one of the founders of the, it was called the, it's still called the Israelite uh, Central Committee. The Mexican Jewish community was not very large, but it was highly fragmented um, before the war. And uh, it, the, the need to help rescue uh, some of the people who were trying to get out sometimes facing a lot of barriers in other countries. Um, but yet Mexico actually had a pretty enlightened and has kept a pretty enlightened policy of, uh, of, uh, of embracing uh, and, and supporting uh, refugees. Uh, certainly that was the case during the war. And uh, so, so all of those stories, the many people I would meet who had, who had Jewish members of the Jewish community whose families had escaped uh, and somehow knew my grandfather, which also was one of the few doctors who could speak German, that was his native tongue, and uh, who could see, um, who they could see there. And my grandmother, who became extremely active uh, in the, in the uh, Mexican literary and intellectual community. And this story was, was all the time told. Uh, and we were uh, very early shown that, uh, first of a pride for our Jewish heritage, and secondly, a sense of uh, outrage at the persecution of any people, uh, given what, what had happened to, to their family. Because you knew that your families maybe were a little different than the other children that you were in school with, did that give you an extra motivational drive and push? I mean, both of your respective families ended up, um, you know, being well-known physicians and working in business. You both are yourselves in the public health world. Did you feel that need to find a career and a hobby and a passion for public service, knowing what your parents and grandparents went through and how you were able to kind of take that to heart and, and become as successful and accomplished as you are today? You know, I think um, that that sense of uh, converting what had happened and translating what had happened to us into um, a different kind of a future and pushing forward came much later. Um, as, as a child and going through high school, um, a lot of it was fear. My father was very ill mentally and physically as a result of the camps. And so it was a continual struggle as a family um, for all of us um, to, to, to move through that through the years. And then, as I know we're gonna speak about later, and then of course he died of a camp-related cancer when, when we were only 18. He had was, stomach cancer and that was directly related to his time in the concentration camps? Right after the camps, um, they did a partial gastrectomy. We never knew exactly why. Um, and so my father died of stomach cancer and uh, there wasn't very much space for that tumor to grow. 
it spread very quickly as a result. And so, yes, I mean, now um, the understanding of what to do about um, gastric cancer would probably have been very different, but at the time, um, yes, and when it was discovered, um, by that point it was very extensive. And so, also suffered from typhus, uh, from what you have told me, and other diseases in the camps. from the, in the camps. unsanitary conditions in the camps. And it all contributed in many ways. But in the end, it was it was the cancer that uh, that took his life that killed him, and but, but you asked um, why did we end up doing what we were doing, and at least it, it, in my case, you know, I'm I'm not so sure it was um, inspirational or even altruistic. It's it's hard for me to think that the world is a safe place, and one of the only things that anchors me is trying to help make it a little bit safer um, for as many people as we can. And in fact, um, my original work was not in the health sector. I went to work with street children in, in Guatemala, so I chose, which made my mother's life much harder, I chose to go to some of the um, most um, violent and difficult places in the world where um, young people, youth, were suffering with um, an, an sort of an effort but a need on my part to try and make some sense out of the lessons um, that I had learned from what we had come out of. But I don't know if it was um, drive and altruism as much as my need to try and feel that the world was a slightly safer place um, than I had grown up knowing it was or is. And yourself, Dr. Frank? <clears throat> in, in that, those stories about why we were in Mexico, um, and uh, uh, there was one message, which was the need to reciprocate, the need to, to be grateful. Um, and, you know, I've come to realize uh, that, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to be, to be generous to your family and your friends. What is very hard is to be generous to strangers. Uh, and so I... Uh, concluded that it's the generosity of, to strangers, to people who really, really are different from you, that actually is what can uh, heal uh, m many of the ills that affect humankind. And my grandparents were the beneficiaries of that generosity to strangers. <clears throat> I mean, the, the stories of them arriving by boat from Hamburg to, the, to Veracruz, having never set foot in Mexico, I mean, this is the 1930s. Um, you arrive to a tropical place with, as they would, t would tell, giant flying cockroaches in the uh, rooms where they would stay. Um, a completely different world. And yet the people there welcomed them. Uh, they were total strangers. And they were yet welcomed and experienced a level of generosity that saved their lives. And my... my Grandparents, my parents, and as I said, made my life possible. <clears throat> my father decided that that was his, his country. He quickly assimilated. They spoke German at home, but he would not teach us German. He did not want us to ever uh, remember at a time when, after the war, my, my father was w left without nationality for a few years. Um, so he had an identity card from the League of Nations. As, as it was then, and when he was offered the opportunity to reclaim his German citizenship, he rejected it. He wanted, he wanted to make sure that he was part of the country that, that, that greeted him. He, uh, thankfully to me, had a large family. We are seven siblings. I have a twin sister. And the seven of us, plus my three cousins from my aunt, her sister, his sister, we, we all, all were thought that we needed to reciprocate that generosity of people who didn't know them but saved their lives. So we all grew with that sort of uh, vocation and, and uh, both my siblings and my cousins, we've all pursued uh, variations of careers uh, in service to, to others. It, it, it was just the, the, the main teaching that we received as, as young children. Since it's actually, in a sense, I hadn't thought of part of why we met. So my father, absolutely refused to allow me to study German when I was in high school. We had a choice of German or Spanish. And I remember being furious that he wouldn't allow me to choose what language I wanted to study. But I had no choice but to study Spanish. So you don't often hear of married couples maybe who are both 
children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. Was that something you two learned about each other early on in your relationship? Did you relate to each other easily because of your family's experiences and history? It was actually one of the first things we spoke about when we first met each other um, and telling that story. Um, but, uh, but also, I have to say that Julio mentioned his large family. You know, as I said, we didn't have any family. And so I remember going in and meeting your very large family and thinking what, you know, a miracle it was to have this very large family of, you know, sort of 40, 50 or 60 people getting together at any time. Um, and rather than being overwhelmed, it was such an incredible experience. And at times I would think, you know, our, our family could have been like that, um, but wasn't. And, uh, and also the, the incredible gift of having your, your father who passed away just a few years ago and with whom um, there was such a strong bond of his support to me having lost my father and, uh, and his, his kindness and love for me that uh, I will always, always cherish for so many years that I didn't have from my own father. I, I mean, I, without any question, of course, I was dazzled by her beauty and her beauty. intelligence. We met uh, professionally <laughs> because we were working in more or less related fields. Um, so we first developed a professional relationship. Well, because I went to give a talk about street children. Right. She went, I, I went to hear her just by, again, one of those coincidences. You inspected uh, a, a hippie, a bald <laughs> hippie. And, uh, right. So she was very, very impressive. In, <laughs> I, I was doing a sabbatical year at Harvard, and, and she was a student in the PhD program in the economics department and came to report on her work with street children and gave a lecture. And because this was Colombia and I'm from Mexico, the director of the center said, you should go to that, to that lecture. And I said, well, I don't work with street children. I said, but you know, it's Colombia, it's the same <laughs> part of the world. Right. And it was the best thing. I was very impressed. Uh, but the minute we started talking more about our personal lives and when I realized she was the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, that was, without any question for me, a, a great uh, magnet uh, because it, it uh, you know, my family, most of my family, except my great uh, uncle, uh, uh, managed to escape a, 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 a most of the direct immediate family. Uh, but, but the story, I, I didn't meet my, my, uh, my father-in-law but knowing about his, his uh, struggle uh, and what happened to him, I have no doubt that that was a big part of the, uh, of the chemistry. It resonated very much. And it was also, you know, the, the, the... And similarly, by the way, with my father, since you mentioned him, and my father's mother, uh, Mariana, who lived to 106, um, having escaped, uh, in a very difficult situation, uh, adored Felicia hmm. as well. They, 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 they really adored her. And your daughter here is named after, after her tonight. My, after my grandmother. And you have another daughter, Hannah, yes. as well. Hannah Sophia. Um, Hannah Sophia and Mariana Haviva. Um, how have you both instilled the you know, lessons and the values um, from your family that you've passed down to your two daughters about the Holocaust? Well, we have, first we have um, a very reform and very practicing family. Um, it's just a part of, I guess, who I was always as a child and the family that we've made that we go to synagogue on Friday nights. Um, not because we have to, but because we want to and because it's part of our lives. Um, and I think that has resonated with them. She may or may not tell you. Um, and the other is that we have always shared um, the history, um, the grandfather that she never met, and, uh, and the suffering, and what that suffering has meant. You know, the, I said in the beginning, I, I can't speak for my father, and thank God I never suffered as he did. But there is no question that many um, of the ways that I suffer, that I've grown up, are a reflection of the fear and suffering that I lived as his child. 
and that my brother lived as his child. Right, there's something coined, you know, the survivor's guilt. There was a part of survivor's guilt, but I think there was also just survivor suffering. Um, seeing my father's years of, of deep depression and how he fought that, that he never slept through a night, um, that he wrote down, you know, in, horrific um, dreams that he would go through every single night of his life that I can remember. Um, and the physical struggles, the scars on his body, um, the way that the surgeries and operations that he had as a child that didn't, that, that weren't performed correctly because they were performed on a Jewish child in Poland that didn't have access. Um, all of that was part of my life growing up, which, um, which drives you, which teaches you many things, but which is also a kind of suffering that you bring with you for the rest of your life. Do you think about his sufferings often? Often and almost all the time. In fact, um, a lot of the work I do, the work that I did on palliative care and access to pain relief was in part driven by that. Um, the things that I learned when he was dying in the hospital of, um, of stomach cancer, one of the in the, the, the last few days, and after I was, I was only just turned 18 with no experience of how to, to manage this period of time with him. And in his sort of last two or three days, um, he couldn't tell if he was in the camps or in the hospital in Toronto. And he said to me, when you or your brother are here, I know where I am. And we, at least I didn't leave his room from then on for the next three days. Um, and also helped him in the end to, to manage the pain and suffering as he, as he ended his life. What does it mean to be a Holocaust survivor today? As we discussed, how do you define uh, a Holocaust survivor? You, of course, are second generation, but you know, your parents escaped and your, and your grandparents escaped right before the actual war. So are you considered a second generation Holocaust survivor? How do you think, you know, it should be defined today in some respect? It's, it's a tricky question. It is a tricky question. And when we thought about it yeah, a little bit as we were looking through some of the questions, and then, you know, it, it made me realize some of these discussions of how much Jewish blood you had to have um, to be um, sent to the concentration camps, to be faced with, with murder and death. And although there's a part of me that and strongly believes it wasn't only, of course, um, the Jews that died in the camps. There were many others that died in the camps for different reasons, for being different. And um, what does it mean to be a survivor? And I also struggle with that word um, as someone who works on cancer and someone who's lived cancer herself, that I can never use the word survivor for cancer because it, it's a different kind of, of survivorship. Um, I will use it um, for those who have suffered um, people's torture of them and their lives in ways that I think really does mean to, to be a survivor. Um, so I think there are many things that can define human beings as survivors of the violence that other human beings commit against them. How would the two of you describe your sense of the world's awareness and understanding of the Holocaust today? I mean, you know, we see rampant, rampant, rampant anti-Semitism across college campuses, you know, as the president of the University of Miami, um, what are you doing to prevent and even address those situations? How do we make sure that history doesn't repeat itself? Um, that, that I think has sadly become an incredibly present and, and pressing question because uh, we are seeing uh, the resurgence of forces of evil and darkness that we thought the world would never experience after what happened at, in World War II. And yet here we are, a century later, basically um, still with uh, tyrants around the world, repeating the, the playbook that was written by Mussolini and Hitler a, a, a century ago. Uh, we have to, first of all, we need to keep talking about this. This is why this conversation is, is so absolutely critical. We have to keep talking about the Holocaust. We need to preserve the memory. We need to do everything in our power to make sure that the next generations continue to understand what happened. We at the University of Miami 
um, are very uh, uh, honored to house the Miller uh, Center for Contemporary Judaic Studies, which is mostly centered around the understanding of the Holocaust. It's a whole center at the university with uh, great scholarship, record keeping, uh, constant lecture series. We have to keep that, that, both the speaking in general, but also the scholarship about the Holocaust, the study about the history and the roots and the root causes of what happened then. And then we need to educate students. Um, we uh, make it a point, first of all, to make it very clear that no instance of discrimination, anti-Semitism or any other form of, of discrimination is valid and admissible in, the, in our campus. Secondly, we need to engage students in, uh, in, in, in active conversation about what it is to deal with people who are different than you. Um, I, I said that it's the generosity to strangers that I think um, developing that ability to be generous to strangers is something that I think is educationable. It's something we can actually educate our children to develop that sense. We hold at the university something, a series of what we call courageous conversations. And in fact, in a couple of weeks, we're having one specifically about antisemitism um, because of the, of the rise. And it is having those spaces to, to talk about that, about that um, uh, to, to, to make sure that we keep talking about this stuff, that we don't normalize it, that we don't ever normalize it. Uh, I think at this point we are uh, seeing, you know, the authoritarian regimes, the regime in Russia and others, um, anti-democratic regimes that deliberately are following a, a, a lot of those playbooks and the only antidote to that is to keep talking and reminding people of where that path leads to. Uh, and so I believe as a president of a university that that's one of our most important um, act, act, actions, uh, that is something we need to, to, to keep doing. It's, it's, it's both the specifics of the Holocaust and the general education on, on cultivating, not tolerance, but actually embracing of differentness. Uh, and, 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 and learning to, to actually value people that are not exactly like you are. Do you see other institutions of higher education really achieving that at this juncture? You know, what more do you think higher education uh, institutions can do uh, versus the general public, versus social media? I think many universities are, are concerned about this. Universities, <clears throat> I, I like to say, should be what I would call exemplary institutions. Institutions that in the way, the, in the values they embrace and the, the behaviors they exhibit in their internal life, set an example for the larger society of which they are a part. So that means that in a climate of growing polarization, with uh, you know the sad situation where a, what was dreamed of initially as a tool to connect people and bring people together, which is social media, has been in many cases turning exactly into the opposite, uh, that we combat that internally in a, in a proactive way, not just waiting for an incident to occur and then you know uh, uh, acting on that, but actually proactively doing that. For example, I think one of the things we need to, um, and we are now explicitly trying to cultivate in our students, is the ability to disagree respectfully. Because we're losing the ability to actually not agree with someone, but do so listening, not dismissing before you, the other person even, even starts talking. And then be able to disagree and do so in a framework of respect. Uh, what I said, the, the idea of appreciating that the inherent wealth of diversity of human beings and learning that the other, which is what that playbook is always based, that playbook that was written in the 1920s and 30s of the last century, starts by identifying an other, someone who is the other, who's not you, and immediately scapegoating that person, blaming that person for all the ills that you experience, and then the next step is unleashing the fury 
and the next step is rationalizing, dehumanizing them, and then rationalizing their um, extermination. And that we know that, we've seen it play out in maybe not our immediate lifetimes, but the lifetimes of, our, of the previous generation. We, gotta, we got to teach that and develop a sense that other is valuable, that there is such a thing as generosity to strangers. And uh, this is something because of, of my history that I feel very strongly about, and we're trying to, in a very proactive way, uh, make it a core part of the educational experience on our campus. When my father you know, wrote one of the, the pieces that he wrote and writes about how he really wanted to give up that, that day and night that he spent in that river, that he had no will to survive. And it was something about the idea of bearing witness that he writes was what made him get out of that river and continue to try to survive when he didn't want to anymore. Um, and those are the sorts of things that I think if you live and breathe that, um, there's so much work to do in our world. Yeah. Resilience is, is a key word when talking and reflecting on the Holocaust. If you are comfortable, I would love for you to share some of your father's poetry with everyone tonight. I would be honored and I'm sure he would be as well. If you can just share the title of his book. It's called Quo Vadis, although that's the title that my mother put on the book. Um, you know, it was, um, it was put together, she put together his writings um, after he died, and it's never been formally published, although my brother seems to be working on a book, and I say I'll work on a book. Um, but it does exist, although not formally published uh, as yet. Um, but this particular piece, and it's a combination of, of short stories and poetry, um, this piece is called A Jewish Child and the German Summer. And uh, Sigmund Nall wrote, with the help of Marie Nall, Summer gathered his belongings, ready to depart on the mighty wings of the wind, glad to leave the tiny German village anxiously awaiting the arrival of autumn. It was not the usual happy summer, gladdening the hearts of little children. Resignation heavily imprinted on his face, summer hugged brother Autumn. Autumn, my dearest of brothers, how I long to see you this year. A weary summer's voice roared through space with the unusual quality of sadness and pain. Why so sad, my brother, asked Autumn. I have never seen you so distressed before. I have never heard so much sadness coming from you ever heretofore. Autumn, my younger brother, I am guilty of a crime. There is blood on my weary old hands. Summer's voice was subdued and sublime. I, who through ages and millennium have protected children all over the world, black, white, red, or yellow, I have failed one five summers old. I who know not what religion means, I the custodian of all the children, no matter from which kind of womb they came, Brother Autumn, I have failed a Jewish child. When I arrived rather late on Sunday, tired, I dozed off. No need to watch over children, I thought, whose parents celebrated mass there on the hill. Suddenly two shots rang in the valley. I awoke and to my horror, I saw a man and a woman shot dead on the edge of the forest down below. A handful of men in uniform searched the forest for more lust. They did not find a little boy, frightened, hidden under the brush. Brother Autumn, I sustained the child with berries, rain, and sun. Now I beg of you to do the same, to ease the burden of blood upon my hands. And I beg and instruct you to pass the word to Brother Winter and Brother Winter to instruct Spring to do the same, so that I find the child alive when I return. The brothers embraced each other and kissed one another upon the cheek. The people in the valley took it for a thunder so mighty they never heard the like before. And when Brother Summer did return to the godforsaken German village, his first steps into the forest found tiny bones scattered, broken, and chewed upon. How does that make you feel when you read your father's words? You know, I, I read the poems and I read the stories every so often. And so I reread before coming this evening. And, you know, it struck me how 
so many decades ago, and, and I said there were so many things I wished I could have, I wished I could have asked him, I wished over the years I could have asked him. He spoke of color, he spoke of any womb, he spoke of all children, he spoke even of a mass when he was probably referring to another kind of service. And so this idea must have been transmitted over these years um, that one protects any child and all children, that one protects any child and all people, and that these holocausts, again, they, they happened and they continue to happen. And there is much that I would say these brothers and now perhaps the only thing I would have changed was to add that there might have been a sister summer, a sister autumn, somewhere there would have been um, some women also participating in this. But the, the idea that it is all individuals and all people of all colors, whatever womb they come from. I understand one of your dog's names is Tikvot, which means hope in Hebrew. Um, as we conclude tonight, what hope do you have for the Jewish people? Oh, I have hope for sort of, I, I have hope for all people. And though I wish that the suffering that we have had and the suffering that we continue to have were not there, um, it gives a certain and tremendous kind of hope for the possibility um, that our world can be a better place in the future. Um, were that the burden were not upon us, but since we have it, um, the fact that we can do so much good with it is, is the hope that I think we have to live with. You spoke of resilience, and my beloved grandmother, Mariana, who, as I said, lived to 106, uh, and actually in three centuries, because she was born at the end of the 19th century, lived through the, all of the 20th century, and then still the first four years of the 21st century. Um, uh, and people would ask her, why, what, what do you attribute your longevity to? Is it that you don't smoke? Is it that you don't uh, drink? She said, yeah, well, I don't smoke. I drink very little, but it's not that. She said, I, it is that I, I have had very difficult moments in my life. Uh, we were forced to leave our homes. We were forced to take our children away. Uh, it was a very traumatic thing. And then we followed what happened to our friends and relatives uh, who stayed back there. And we had to start a whole new life. And um, there was a point where the Nazis actually identified that we were there. And my grandfather lost his entire clientele because it was more, mostly German people. And most of the Germans who lived in Mexico were uh, in favor of the Nazi regime. So one day, all of a sudden, he had no patience. There was a boycott against him. Um, my grandmother had to work uh, in a very modest uh, position to be able to bring the family up, uh, uh, up while, while my grandfather tried to rebuild his life. He said, I've, I've, I've gone through a lot of things and I've seen a lot of suffering uh, with people that are close and dear to me. But the reason of my longevity is that I live according to a principle. And the way she phrased it is to me the best definition of resilience. She said, if I fall seven times, I get up eight. Meaning that resilience is not just the ability to rebound to the place you were before, but that you actually learn from the adversity and you get up eight times if you fell seven times. You find the lessons that make you a better and wiser person and one able to heal the world. And that is my hope for everyone, every, every individual and every people, like the Jewish people, who had suffered a, a disproportionate amount of the horrors that befall many groups in society. It is my hope that we learn that by falling seven times and getting up eight, we will learn what happened in those seven times and we will be wiser to avoid them ever happening again. And this is why conversations like the one we've had this evening are to me so meaningful and so valuable. Lessons, you know, lessons from our parents. Thank you for your time tonight. And thank you everyone for being here. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Raina.